So thank you for coming. Um, I'll try to project my voice. It's uh, kind of cozy here. So um, if anybody can't hear me, please just raise your hand and let me know. Cool. Uh, clicker. All right. Clicker, get started. Cool. So um, before I get started, um, just a little bit of background context. Um, this is work that I've uh, done over about a year, four year period at Meta. Um, and um, I, I feel like there is a little bit of difference between the kind of end to end work that we've done there than the typical understanding of machine learning and ML ops. So I thought this was like good experience to share with everyone. Um, and what we started off doing is basically trying to push the envelope in terms of automation and taking a look at what engineers were doing at Meta in terms of taking an idea um, that needs ML and shipping it into production, right? And really asking ourselves, um, how do we automate as much as we can, right, in a product, in a platform um, that's supporting product teams, right? Um, and so um, I think there's like good lessons and, and, and things to share from that uh, experience. Cool. So with that said, um, next slide. Oops. Clickers having issues. All right, cool. So um, state of fair, uh, before, uh, before we started building Looper, I think that's the state of fair at uh, AI platforms and infrastructure was similar to a lot of places uh, that, that, uh, uh, in, in companies in that there are lots of product teams. Uh, most product teams, they have like maybe a few large impactful machine learning use cases. There are lots of like ML engineers, data scientists that work on those cases. And in terms of having a horizontal org, there's a lot of platform teams and orgs uh, here that I've ch chatted with folks. You know, we're um, building modular platforms to support the data scientists to do the ML ops. So things like training, hosting, and increasingly like things like feature store and whatnot, basically taking common things um, that product teams are doing with respect to ML and, and consolidating them. And I was actually leading the training platform team at, uh, at BLearner Flow at the time. Um, but what we observed was that in addition to those cases, we had a constant stream of users, um, product team engineers, that would constantly say, like, I have this great idea. Right? If only I could ship this feature based on machine learning, you know, our products would do better. But you know, like, I have no experience. You know, you're the platform team. Tell me what I need to do to ship this. Right? And when we've got through telling them, you know, here's how you gather your data, do your labels, clean your data, train your model, tune your model, host your model, they're like, OK, I'm not doing that. <laughs> right? I'm, done, you know, I'm just one person with my idea. Um, I can't do this. Right? And, and so, a lot of teams, you know, even at Meta, with hundreds and hundreds of machine learning engineers, they're all focused on you know, ads ranking, feed ranking, and whatnot. There's still a lot of ideas that slip through the cracks and that we don't have resources to pursue. And so that was kind of the motivation of building this system, is you know, let's build a system that even engineers without machine learning uh, expertise and experience can still use and ship features. Cool. Uh, with that said, uh, we ended up over that time period iterating over a product that had three different versions, over three different separate versions. Um, we ended up, you know, supporting uh, you know over 100 teams at, at Meta. Uh, we were hosting about uh, 400 to 1,000 models, depending on how you count, because we can read a lot of models. Um, and we did some user surveys. Um, about 15% of the use cases in, on this system. Um, ha actually had uh, ML engineers on their team. So the rest of the teams were um, product software engineers. Um, applications that happened uh, um, on these uh, systems were personalization, ranking, prefetching, user notifications. And typically, um, product teams like in Facebook and Instagram, and they can ship things without additional staffing. Right? So it's pretty lightweight. And, um, you could, and in many cases, they saw a good improvement in their product. So, going on ahead. So I'm going to jump into kind of uh, kind of terms definition. Uh, I, I promise I, I picked this title before the keynote speech was picked. I, I, that was not on purpose. 
<laughs> I just thought, you know, what would be a cool title to pick, right? Uh, um, but, um, but basically, uh, what, what I mean by Kaggle Paradigm is basically this idea that, you know, we're going to gather some data, and, we, and, and the, the interesting thing or the key thing is how you build the best model that represents this data, right? Um, so that's kind of, in my view, like this model-centric perspective. It's about testing, experimenting to build the best model. And then the ML ops part is like once we kind of found the recipe to build the best model, um, you know, we got to ship it into production, make sure it can be retrained, and, and all of that can happen smoothly, right? So um, that's kind of what I meant um, by like the Kaggle plus ML ops um, paradigm, right? That's kind of the traditional understanding that we have here. So what's missing from this model-centric paradigm, right, where we're talking about how to build models and then how to ship these to production? Uh, when we're talking about, like, hey, I got ideas that want to ship into product, right? So first, I think there's not as much attention paid to the data. Um, now, I think Feature Store and all of that, I think it's starting to move in that direction where that's part of the ML Ops stack. Um, but in addition to features, there's also labels, right? So um, what proxy tasks are you going to be using um, to build a model with, right? Um, I've sat through like hundreds of office hours uh, of product engineers coming. A lot of them, you know, don't know, right? It's like, what feature should I use, you know, to, to, to build, uh, you know, what labels should I use? Um, they don't have a good idea of how to do this. And I think there's like, at least at, at Meta, there is good infrastructure for automation to be done, you know, even if the people with the idea about the features um, don't, uh, use case features don't necessarily know, right? And the second part of this is um, how to ensure that the product impact, uh, you actually have product impact, right, from these models, right? So the, uh, often people talk about, like, there's the online-offline gap, right? If I train the greatest model with the best, you know, AUC or precision recall, any, whatever you pick, right, um, that doesn't necessarily translate into user engagement for your app. Right? It doesn't translate you know, into like, hey, how many megawatts of power am I going to consume in my data center? Right? Um, and these are really things that your business cares about. Right? You know, how much more users is like how much more money we're going to make, and, and how much megawatts of power is how much money we got to spend you know, to, to earn those uh, user, user engagement. Right? So that's what the product teams or the company really cares about. Um, and, uh, but that's not necessarily exactly what the offline model metrics say. Right. So how do you kind of make sure that translates? So um, what we kind of did was like because we had such a large number of users and ideas that, um, that came to us, um, so like, hey, we got you know, applications of like, hey, what kind of preference do users have? Do we need to profess some data? How do we rank some contents? Should we send them notifications or not? And if so, how much? So all of these use cases, um, you know, they have commonalities in them, right? So it's really a refactoring, a factoring of like the users with their use cases. Um, so um, most of them, or most if not all of them, are about you know needing to learn from data to optimize some decision point. And the decision point is like the key point, right? It's your application, whatever it is that the product team is building, that needs to behave a little bit differently. In under different contexts, to different users, um, in different circumstances, right? And, and the decision point is the key, right? And just to kind of highlight uh, kind of a little bit of API differences, right? If I take a typical ranking model um, that uh, is like very common in terms of like traditional machine learning products, um, in the model-centric view, you might kind of think about if I were to build an API or whatnot, it might be uh, something like, hey, you know, given a set of items that I need to rank, you know, um, let me return you the, prob you know, the model will return me the probability of whether a user clicks on something, um, user is going to share this thing or comment on it, like it, whatever, right? Or if they really don't like it, they close my app, that could be a label as well. Um, so all of those type of things, right? But then um, the application, right, the, the software product still has to say, let, let me take that, calculate some total score from some parameterized combination of these predictions, and then I'm going to act on it, right, by either showing this thing to the user or not, right? 
Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of end-to-end -end view where we're thinking about this whole thing as a strategy for optimizing the software, really this is kind of like take a, take a list of stuff, you know, tell me which one I'm going to show to my user or which set I'm going to list I'm going to show to my user, right? And then the system can take care of all of the feature fetching and all of that behind the scenes, right? So that's a, dram a, dr a drastic simplification of the APIs, right? So when you do this, um, what do you solve, right? Um, first, you kind of solve the what data problem um, by uh, controlling the logging, the generation of the data, right, within the platform. So um, what features, what labels are logged are, are, are done via the platform um, for use case specific configurations, right? Um, there's a really good added benefit of doing this. Um, which is that um, you really have this, what we call like a full chain of custody on the data, right? You don't depend on the product team to generate the data, um, which means we can solve 99% of the data quality issues, right? Um, that arises a lot in machine learning use cases. So um, in my time, I've like talked with hundreds of customers there. I really only had one conversation where somebody had a data a label leakage issue. Right, which I think was like pretty cool um, in a system. The other part that this solves is the, uh, the insure impact aspect, which is the online offline gap. So what you can do is because you have control of the decisions, now you can integrate any of the A-B testing that needs to happen right, into this system. Right? And really all the product team has to tell you is what metric we care about right, in, under the A-B testing system. And running the experiments and optimizing the parameters and strategies that you need to use the model output for can be done automatically as well, right? Um, and then when, when we talk about, kind of think about this use case strategy mode, when you're deploying, you're not just deploying a model, right? You're deploying everything bundled together, right? Including what data you're gathering to build a model with, right? What, uh, what the labels are, how do you, know, you build a model? as well as how you use the model output to affect software behavior. So all of that bundled together is a, is a strategy. Click. Did I do this right? Jeez. Come on. I think I'm having an issue with clicking. Can I go back? I don't know what's going on. Oh, you're helping me. OK. Uh, forward, forward, please. Forward. Uh, forward. Ooh, forward. Forward. And one more. Yes, OK. All right, we're here. Excellent. Um, so um, here's the kind of like the user journey of how users would use this system, right? Putting it together. Um, Almost all of the um, user engagement in, under the system is UI driven, right? So in terms of like uh, what features and, 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 and whatnot, basically they come to our uh, uh, user uh, UI and then they start a use case, right? There's a little bit of code that's needed because the API point is a decision point in your software system or app or whatever it is. So you do have to inject some piece of code there. Um, that says like, hey, tell me what to do, right? At some point, um, and that's like a live call within uh, within the app, right? Uh, and but once that's done, the data gathering, uh, the model training, uh, model cannering, bringing it online, um, even including the experimentation, can all be done behind the API, right? So then it takes you know a couple of days to a week to train a day, uh, to uh, to train models. Uh, depending on you know, how much data you need um, in order to train your model. Um, and then if you want to do online experiments, then it'll take like a week or two. Um, um, but once you're done, you're happy with the result, you can hit launch, and, and it can just launch, right? Um, um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, um, diving a little bit deeper into the architecture. Um, on the blue box is what I would consider um, the typical understanding of like um, you know ML ops uh, whatnot, which is like, hey, I got data systems, I'm gonna log them, I've got monitoring, I'm gonna train them, I'm gonna deploy the model, and all of that, and that can all be managed automatically in the system. But in addition 
to that, right? Um, feature store nowadays, I think, is like um, becoming more commonplace and, and part of the system. Um, but in addition to that, right, our, our client API sits directly in the software stack. Um, and so the engagement with feature store happens automatically. So this is kind of the what data part, right? Um, and so we actually hold the configuration and data in terms of what data to use um, to train the machine learning uh, models. And then the, the really key point is there's an experimentation system um, integration as well. And the whole thing is version, right? So you can deploy multiple strategies, do the comparisons, and do all of that, right, as well. 10 minutes? OK. Cool, excellent. So let me move a little bit faster. Um, so this is kind of the verbal version of this, which is kind of um, there's an entire versioning system that's built on top of this. Features, labels, models, policies are all versioned in configuration. And that's kind of what enables the automation to happen, right? You don't want your automation to be writing new code to commit into customer code bases. So, so all, every, all of that gets pulled out into configuration and properly versioned. And that also allows, allows us to do like data compatibility support uh, and support like all the automation that's needed to do the vertical optimization, direct optimization of product metrics. Next slide. Cool. Um, adoption curves, um, usually you can get something configured pretty quickly in about a day or two. Um, training can take up to a week or two, depending on, again, how long, how much of data you need to log before your, your model uh, becomes good. Um, online experiments, another two to four weeks. And product launch can be uh, a month or two. So um, really, really cool. Um, I've had you know, customers come and talk from product teams, you know, literally with like, I have this idea. And a month later, I see them shipping in production um, you know, onto Facebook users, uh, which is really cool. The other aspect is like a lot of this like practice, best practice in terms of data quality and things that people tend to screw up in, in real machine learning use cases are now behind the scenes. And we're, we have custody of that. Right? So um, your product engineers and whatnot who might not know, right? I mean, it's, their, their job is to make the product better, right? They don't have to learn all of that and do all of that practice. And, and that really does happen less frequently. And because we build this uniform um, system, it, um, it really, really um, um, it makes it easy to, to kind of handle uh, any changes to the system. The, you don't have like 100 different users building things 100 different ways, right? Next slide, please. Cool. Um, so um, in conclusion, um, the takeaway from this right, is basically um, in an end-to-end -end system, we kind of took a different goal, which is like we're not necessarily supporting the, uh, the data scientists, people who are building model. We're supporting product teams to directly ship um, and, you know, feature, ML-based features into product. And um, we wanted to really automate as much as possible, right? What, what is the maximum amount of mod automation we can do? And then the kind of the conclusion to take away from this is that, hey, like in order to do that and do that right, we really had to move away from thinking of like, hey, we're building models and shipping models um, into, hey, we're shipping a whole bundled strategy, right? Where the input to building the models is also under our control, which is the data. Um, and also the application of those models, right, are also under our control. Um, and really take all of that together into as a strategy. Um, and really that, what that allows us to do is kind of address a lot of these like extra concerns, which is like data use and uh, ensuring that um, whatever was built have impact. Um, I think I'm probably going to skip the next slide and just um, end it here. Cool. Oh, yeah, sorry, this one. Um, so there is a paper on this um, that uh, Igor uh, put together from, from this. So if you're interested, um, take a look. I think we have another one on like AutoML as well um, after this. Um, and then there's definitely a Facebook engineering blog post as well if you're interested. Just Google uh, Looper and Meta AI, and, and it should show up. Cool. I think I am done. Yeah, for sure. Go for it. Um, do you need a mic?
So, <clears throat> when you build these uh, platforms, right, like how do you uh, define whether you have to build your own platform versus use some of the native cloud provider services mm -hmm. like AWS? I see. Um, there wasn't much, much of a choice at Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Facebook has its own, like, everything. So, um, we really built on top of the base layer, which is also proprietary uh, mm -hmm. at, at Meta. So, um, so, there was not much of a decision there. Okay. But in general, like, what are the guiding principles that can help you decide whether you want to go with the own proprietary versus, versus well yeah. now that I'm at a startup right uh, you know it's basically whatever we can build that's um, that's you know already built you know we should use that right um, I I don't that's that's seems like a good principle I mean we don't want to be handling managing stuff like when we're only five people right so okay thank yeah. you yeah. Hi, uh, I've got a question about onboarding new customers or clients. Like, I, I understand if someone already used your platform, they understand, uh, they, they know what to do. But you mentioned that 15% only had MLEs and mm. not many data scientists or engineers. How, how, do you, how do you onboard? Do you have conversations, do documents? Yeah, um, I think that's probably something that can always be done better. But um, basically, um, we have a self-serve use case. So basically, our support is um, come to office hours, use our user group, or, you know, or use our documentations. Um, I think in terms of abstraction bleeding, um, it is like still a pretty small team. We're like a team of like 10 people, a little bit, 8, 10 people. And so um, in terms of API bleeding through some of the ML concept to the product users, we still have some of that going, um, but, um, but in, by, by and large, uh, people don't have to learn a lot of machine learning to use the system. Yeah. Gotcha. So you also have some templates for them to show and kind of point at um, examples? They don't really necessarily have to change anything. Um, remember, all the data gathering, all of that is within our system, and so there is some configuration changes, so they do have to look at our config file if they want to go customize stuff, but if they don't, um, the other principle is like good defaults, right? And so in general, um, we hide all of that. Like you, you don't have to pick what kind of model you're training, what kind of hyperparameter, we automate all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Norm, uh, great talk, thank you. I've got actually one last question. For people that are just starting out with machine learning platforms, what do you think is the most valuable thing to automate so they can get the most bang for their buck. What's the most valuable thing to automate? Yeah, what would be the first thing in your in your experience? I, I think, yeah, I, I think um, you know the the automated model training is still like you know pretty uh, pretty good place to start. Um, I think nowadays the libraries for like automa automatic model selection and hyperparameter tuning on like even open source ones like from Amazon and whatnot are all there. So just throw at it. I feel like um, people have been at it long enough. There are things that you can just throw at it, and it usually works reasonably well. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Why don't we give Norma a round of applause here?